thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is maybe the third time I've given a talk here, and I can't remember the last time. It, was, it may have been a decade ago. Um, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Can you turn up the sound OK, so let's see if we can move this a little bit. OK, is that better? Yeah. If I, if I talk into my neck. <laughs> OK, um, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I've had uh, some very interesting conversations uh, today that range from the great oxidation event to uh, fisheries in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So that, that kind of spans a range. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, paleo climate uh, kind of fits into our understanding of what's going to happen in the future. And uh, one of the things that uh, is more often said than done is that the work that we're doing on paleoclimate is necessary to understand the context for what's happening today and will improve the predictions for the future. And I don't know how many times I've read that in a proposal, uh, but, uh, but the number of times that that's actually come to fruition uh, is many, many fewer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is uh, and what the real problems are in, in, in trying to make that work um, and uh, with a few examples of, of stuff that we've done um, in the meantime. So, click. Yes, it works. Um, this is obviously the, the real issue. Uh, if we had observations of the future, we would obviously trust them more than models. But unfortunately, observations of the future are not available at this time. <laughs> right? It's not funny, it's real, right? If you're going to make a prediction for the future, it has to be based on something. That something is a model, whether it's physics or statistics or empirical or something, it has to be a model because we don't have any observations of the future. The whole basis of science is to make skillful predictions, right? Skillful predictions require a model of some sort. So how do you make models better? How do you make models credible? And how do you evaluate the credibility of those models? That's the key question that we have. So um, this, was, this was understood uh, very many uh, years ago. Hutton, obviously the, uh, the founder of, uh, of geology of the science, uh, said uh, rather convolutedly, uh, from what has actually been, we have data for concluding with regard to that which is to happen thereafter. Uh, in, uh, in 1985, that was uh, shortened to, um, why is this not working? All right, your clicker, the green light has gone out. Okay, no clicker. Okay, so there we are. That was a long time to get to a very boring joke. Anyway, back to the future, right? So that's the idea. We go back so that we can understand what's going to happen in the future, assuming not necessarily that everything is exactly the same as, as uh, in the past as it will be in the future, but that a lot of the things uh, are analogous. Uh, so one of the things that, that we've done uh, recently uh, is, the one, this is going back a little bit, so uh, CMIT5 was a big international collaboration of all the different modeling groups who did a whole bunch of very specific uh, sets of simulations, both for future predictions, for current climate, and for changes in the past. Right? So um, we, we did a whole bunch of different configurations with lots of different things, hundreds of, well, tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of model years uh, at this point, um, and uh, many, many, many terabytes of, of data. Far too much for us to uh, actually explore on our own. Now, the good thing about CMIT5 was that it is an open data archive. So anybody can go in uh, and look at those data. They can slice it any which way they can. Um, and while there are limitations on how much data you can bring down to do that kind of analysis, there's been thousands of, paper that, thousands of papers that have been written about this data set, um, uh, both pulling out interesting things across the, the ensemble, pointing out where all the models are wrong in the same way, pointing out where they get things right, and then trying to link the things that happen in the, in the paleo runs to the things that are going to happen in the future. Um, OK, so here are the, uh, the paleo runs that, that were part of the, uh, the analysis. So uh, past 1,000 is basically you know, the last millennium plus a little bit, so starting around uh, 850 AD. Uh, the OGM is the last glacial maximum around 20,000 uh, years ago, and the mid-Holocene. So that's a kind of yeah, 6,000 uh, 6, BP 
uh, type of uh, time period. Oh. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the paleo simulations were not a big part of what was in CMET5, but they were a part. And lots of modeling groups were supposed to do all of the things on the outside, the tier one uh, ring. So everybody was supposed to do those. And then, and then the, only the people that were really, really interested would do the, the kind of uh, the second tier stuff. Um, actually, it's the other way around. So the central, the central part is what everybody did. And then people did less and less as you got further away from the center. Uh, but that means that, that, that many, many modeling groups did very similar experiments, uh, you know, particularly for the LGM and the mid Holocene and, and even the last millennium. Oh, and the, the key thing uh, that is, I make this work. I can make this work. Um, so the key thing uh, is this, that the same models are being used for the past, the present, and the future, right? Which means that if a model has a bias, if a model has something interesting, if a model has some capability, then you can take forward an analysis that you'd done for the last millennium and assume that it was still going to be true in the, in the future. Um, up until this, uh, this effort, uh, people had not done that. People had done future simulations with their state-of-the-art, everything, bells and whistles kind of models, whereas the paleo stuff was, a, at best, a, uh, a, 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 an unloved stepsister and uh, was left to use the, uh, the dregs of the model and the, and the computing power. And so they, weren't, they were often not the same models. And in fact, the paleo models had often never been run for the future scenarios. So understanding something from, from looking at those and then saying something about the future was very difficult because people had not done the same things. So this is the first time that, uh, that people had really mandated that. Everybody complained because, oh, it's going to take so long. But you know, it's been, it's been five years, no more, when we did 11. So this is, it's been almost a decade since we set this up. And you know what? That was enough time to run your state-of-the-art model for these, uh, for, these, uh, for these periods. And in fact, a lot of people did. So. Um, the kinds of configurations that people put in uh, were attempts to do the best that they could for each of these periods, but they were not perfect, right? So uh, the mid-Holocene, the, the big change that you see there is the orbital change, the difference in the, in the, in the orbit of the Earth. Um, the greenhouse gas changes are pretty small compared uh, until at least you get to the pre-industrial period. Vegetation changes are very small. There are some changes to the ice sheets from present day that most people did not include. That's a factor in, where, in, in why they may be wrong. Um, uh, but we know nothing about really the solar variability during this period. We know nothing about volcanoes during this period. Uh, we've, we have some estimates of, of land use change that had even started by this period. But again, most of those things did not make it into these simulations. Uh, the LGM, uh, we're looking at an equilibrium kind of climate change. So you've got the ice sheets, you've got the greenhouse gases. Um, you might have the, the dust change, sea level change, vegetation changes. Not, all of, not every group did the same thing for each of these different uh, uh, elements. But the big things are basically the ice, ice sheets, the orbital change, and the, and the greenhouse gases. Uh, the last millennium, the, these are transient runs. So you start off you know, more than 1,000 years ago with the idea that uh, you will be able to see what the, the volcanic and the solar and the orbital and the greenhouse gases towards the end uh, impacts would have, including land use changes. Um, and you're looking for, you know, can you explain things like the Little Ice Age, the medieval warm period? Do these patterns, are there, are there interesting feedbacks to the ocean circulation from the forcings? Those kinds of questions. Um, you're trying to see something about the, uh, the you know, you, you, could, you could think about the, the, the frequency of, of large scale extreme events like the mega droughts that, uh, that we see in the record for North America. You know, do the models produce such things at the right time, the right frequency, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's a lot of different questions. Um, and all of those questions have some relevance to what's going to happen in the future. Different changes in precipitation patterns are obviously very relevant to what's going to be happening in the future. Changes in ocean circulation as a function of forcing are relevant to what's going to be happening in the future. Mega droughts, regional responses, and all the rest. Of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is this is a picture of of how uncertain uh, some of the. Uh, 
uh, some of the, uh, the conclusions are, I mean, this is from AR4, but the picture didn't change in AR5 uh, at all. Um, so uh, where you have uh, the dots, okay, um, it's not really a, a statement about significance of the, uh, of the response. It's merely a statement that 80% of the models agree on the sign of the change. Okay, that is a very low bar. <laughs> okay, let's, let's be clear. Um, this, this has the illusion of saying something very significant, but actually it is not saying something very significant. Um, and so, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the patterns that you get? So, you know, almost all the models agree that in the high latitudes you're going to have more rainfall. Well, that's kind of obvious because the water vapor is warming, uh, it, it is increasing, and so you have net advection to the poles, and so water vapor increases, so rainfall is going to increase, uh, rainfall and snowfall right, precipitation. So that's, that's pretty robust, okay? So all the models agree. Right on the equator, all the models agree that there's more energy, there's going to be more convection, there's going to be more local rainfall. Okay, again, that's something that uh, uh, it's a strong response and the models all agree on the sign. And then if you look in the zonal mean, you can see the impact of this kind of horseshoe pattern here where you get drying in the, uh, in the subtropics. And that's basically because the models all suggest an expansion of the Hadley cell, and so the downwelling parts of the, of the Hadley cell, you've got increased drying, that area is expanding to the, to the pole, right? So that's what you're seeing there. Um, but unfortunately, if you look at where there is no agreement, not even on sign, it turns out to be the really important places, right? So the US, uh, you know, pretty much the entirety of South America, Africa, right? Uh, India, uh, Australia, not even agreement on the sign. Right? So that's, that's pretty poor because the number of people who are living in the areas where there's no agreement, you know, that's already five billion people. Right? So you, know, you might think we could do a better job on that. We, well, we can. Hopefully. Okay. So why do, we, why do we care about paleo? Why can't we just look at the data from today when we've got all these data, we've got satellites, we've got stations, we've got you know, ocean-going cruises, why can't we just why can't we just stick with that? Great. Okay. This biggest issue is that future climate change is out of sample. Right? There's, no, there's no observations in the instrumental period that we can calibrate or correlate to get to where we think we're going to end up by the end of the century. Not even the end of, by, by 2040. Right? By, by even, even now, in, in, uh, in many ways, we are uh, increasingly outside of the variability that, that existed in the instrumental period. And uh, that's A, terrifying, and B, it makes prediction very, very tricky, right? Because you don't only have to, you can't just interpolate between things that you've observed, you have to be extrapolating in new directions. In practice, what it means is that if I line up all the models for the 20th century, and, and whatever metric you want, whether it's the trend, whether it's the climatology, whether it's the seasonality, whether it's the variability, whatever you like, I line all those models up, and I say, which model is the best? Well, let's take the best five models in that particular metric. Well, it's a little bit awkward, because if I take a different metric, it's a different five models entirely. And more to the point, those five models that I picked that are the best for that particular thing have, in general, projections that span the entire range of all the projections. So there's no actual correlation between the skill in any particular metric that, that you're looking at right now and what it thinks that it's going to be doing in the future. Right? So you say, oh, I'm going to take the models that have the best ENSO. I take the model that has the best ENSO and you know, a couple of others, and they're just as divergent as the whole ensemble. I haven't really gained anything. It's important to remember that paleoclimate is not an analog. Right? So where we are going in the 21st century has never happened before. Never, not ever. And so there's no time period that we can go in the past and we can just say, oh, well, it's going to be exactly like this. Because if we did, then we'd spend all of our time looking at that period and, uh, and we wouldn't bother with anything else. But many of the things that we anticipate happening, changes in sea ice, changes in the ITCZ, changes in the Hadley circulation, changes in the ocean circulation, all of these things have happened in the past for different reasons. And so 
what we're looking for in paleoclimate is not an analog, but a test, a, a test drive of the same machinery. Um, obviously, we care about climate change and paleoclimate because we want to understand what happened, right? So that's, that's usually the reason why we're doing any of this. Um, but we need, to, uh, we need to move on from just being interested in the past for its own sake. And uh, when, I have, when I have ever talked to program managers who have the big budgets, right? so not the program managers who run the paleo program or the geology program, but the people who fund them and the people that fund them, their interest in paleoclimate for paleoclimate's sake is very, very close to zero. But you can get them very, very excited if you tell them very specifically how understanding something about paleoclimate is going to make an, a difference to a prediction in the future. What do you need to do this kind of stuff? You need data synthesis on the paleoclimate side. Now, a couple of the conversations I had this morning were really all about this and why it doesn't happen enough. It doesn't happen enough. More data, more synthesis, more better understanding of the uncertainties in those syntheses. Climap, Margo, DASMAP, um, uh, Pages 2K, uh, all of these things are totally necessary uh, before the paleo stuff is going to really get into these kind of analyses. Um, we need massive improvements in, in archives and databases. We're moving that way for the last millennium. We are a long, long, long way from that in terms of deeper time or, uh, or the ocean, uh, ocean uh, drilling program uh, data. Um, and we need more connection of the paleo modeling to, to the CMIP archives. We need to do better paleo models. We need to do uh, more uh, realistic paleo simulations that include all of the things that we think have changed, not just the things that are convenient for the modelers to include. Uh, and we need to use a lot more forward models. Like, do you really understand your proxy? Right? Do you really understand your speleotherm, your marine sediment core, your, uh, your ice core? What are the processes by which these things are being recorded? We need to understand the systematics of water isotopes. We need to understand uh, how the carbon cycle works if you're going to be looking at carbon-13 excursions. We need to understand the biology if you're looking at um, uh, export production, et cetera. Right. So um, generally speaking, when you're doing a, a simulation for paleoclimate, there's like, three different things that you can do. You know, one, and this is obviously the, the easiest one, uh, is that you run something for the Cretaceous or for the last glacial maxima, for whatever, and you compare it to the data that exists uh, there. And the idea there is, like, can the models just simulate the changes that we're seeing, right? Even in the grossest scale. Um, questions that you can ask is, can you distinguish between different models, different forcings, different responses, so that you can test the hypotheses that you might have had uh, for why anything changed uh, for any particular reason? Can we explain what happened in the past? Right? So that's, those are all great things to be doing with, uh, with paleo models. Um, the second uh, thing to do is to look for things that are robust across time. Right, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. If we can find features, large-scale features, large-scale emergent features of the, of the climate system that held true in multiple periods of the past, that are true today, what can we then say about those changes in the future? Right? And so I'll give you some examples of how that works. And the third thing you can do is that you can try and use the model's skill at, predi at predicting what we know to have happened in the past to say something about the future. Now, the reason why you might think that that is uh, more hopeful than doing it in the 20th century is because the changes are much bigger at the LGM than they are from 1950 to 2000, right? So when you're talking about large changes and you need to have credibility for the large changes that we're going to see, you need to find out-of-sample tests that have an equivalent magnitude. Right? So the LGM is great, the Pliocene is great, you know, even the Eocene and the PTM, these are great, big, large effects that if we could have confidence that the models were doing those correctly, we would have a lot more confidence that the models are projecting what's going to happen in 2100 correctly. So here's, uh, here's some examples. Um, so this is six different models uh, that were all doing uh, the, same, uh, the same simulations, right? So you've got 
Uh, they all did abrupt four times CO2. This is what happens if you increase four CO2 by four times, and then you just see what happens. 1% uh, increasing CO2, slightly different variation on that. Uh, here are the historical runs. So that's from 1850 through to, this would have been to 2005. Um, and then they did the mid-Holocene runs, and they did the old GM runs, right? So uh, you have here a data set where all the models did the same experiments, and you can compare these things in, in a in a very interesting way. So, uh, you know, can you see some obvious connections? Right, so uh, things like, uh, so this is, this is the mean annual temperature in the SST, this is the maximum temperature, this is the, of the cold period, this is the maximum temperature of the warm period, and this is the seasonality, right? So even here, like you compare the abrupt full-time CO2 to the change in seasonality in the LGM, these things look like they're mirror image, right, or just inversion. So that means that you can go to the LGM and be able to say something about the seasonality that that same model is going to predict for the future. And if you can constrain it to what actually happened, right, you might be able to get a better sense of what will happen. Um, so we do, uh, so here's some of the, the LGM comparisons to the observations. And, and you can see a little bit about what the problem is. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the dots here are the, uh, the data set from uh, Margo SST in the, uh, and, and Bartlin uh, uh, pollen, pollen data. Um, you know, what you're seeing here doesn't look terribly uh, surprising. It's much colder in North America because there's a huge ice sheet there, but that's also where there's no data because there's a huge ice sheet there. Um, places in the tropics where we have some of the data, you know, the patterns in the data don't look brilliant, and they don't all look, they don't all line up. Particularly in the North Atlantic, there's a lot of things that don't line up at all. Um, uh, if you look on land, it looks a little bit better, but there the signals are, are, are much larger. So you might think, on average, we're not doing too badly. The planet is about five degrees cooler than uh, than it was. Um, uh, but in, in the details, uh, you're, seeing, you're seeing some things which don't look quite right. Um, this is uh, when you look uh, at those points where you have data all on their own. Um, and so here's the mid-Holocene data comparisons. Here's the, uh, here's the LGM data comparisons. Uh, so this is... What have we got here? So this is the model, this is the data. Uh, and you can say, okay, well, everything here is blue, so we're not doing too badly, but, but all of that blue hides a lot of discrepancies in the details. Uh, the mid-Holocene, uh, you can see some things, but you actually you can see that the mid-Holocene, um, you know, they don't, uh, the patterns, you know, at the gross level, they look okay, but actually in details, they're not very good. Uh, so there's more going on there than we think. Um, and then this is the, uh, here's the, the SST data. And you can see again, well, it's kind of okay, like comparing that to that and then comparing this to this. Um, the historical stuff is better done, uh, uh, but there's some big discrepancies here. So, if we're gonna do this properly though, we really have to sample all of the uncertainty. Right, so, uh, so imagine, that, you know, what are, the, what are the uncertainties, right? So the model might be rubbish, right? So there's uncertainty in the model. Uh, the data might be rubbish, right? So there's uncertainty in the data. Um, and then what we think went on, the drivers of any change, well, that might be rubbish too, right? So there's uncertainty in the forcing. So what is the exact shape of the LGM ice sheet? Nobody really knows. Uh, what, is the, um, uh, what is the level of background aerosol during the mid-Holocene? Nobody really knows, right? What was the dust level of the LGM? Yeah, you have some idea, but nobody really knows. Okay, so there's uncertainty in the drivers of change. Now, one of the things that we collectively do to save ourselves time, but in the end cost us, uh, cost us understanding, is that when you run these model simulations, you know, there's a committee that gets together and they say, what are we going to ask people to do? And nobody wants to do very much work, and so they all come across, they all, they all uh, coalesce on one set of forcings uh, that they want everybody to do. You will use this ice sheet with this change in dust, with this change in the orbit, and no other changes. And so you end up with a situation, like in this first graph, where you can, you can sample the observational uncertainty, because that's independently done. 
And you can sample some of the structural uncertainty because you've got multiple models, which all of which have their own biases. Uh, but the forcings uncertainties are totally unsampled, right? So what if the ice sheet was a slightly different shape? What if the dust level was different? What if the uh, other aerosols were changing differently? Right? And so you're not sampling any of that. And so if this is the real world, right, uh, in, some, in some phase space, uh, basically all of the models that you just ran are on some plane that's actually never going to intersect with the real world. Right? So you say, oh, yeah, all the models are like this. And you say, well, all the models are wrong. But why are they wrong? You don't, you don't, you don't know. Right? Did you just not use the right forcing that might have brought you all over here? Or is it that the models are not struck, that you're not seeing enough structural variation in the models? They don't include ocean eddies, for instance. Maybe that's an important point. But the basic factor is, is that you're in a situation where you cannot tell why there is a discrepancy. And that's, uh, that's, that's somewhat problematic because that's the key thing. You know, if the discrepancy is because of the forcing, well, then that can be fixed. If the discrepancy is because of the structural uh, kind of models that you're using, that's a much, much more harder thing. OK, so what you really want to be doing is sampling these things in a much more intelligent way such that the observed, the actual true thing that happened is somehow encapsulated by the spread of models that you have. But we don't, we have not, uh, to this point, designed our ensembles like this. We've designed our ensembles like this. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that, is, uh, that is not optimal. OK, nonetheless, uh, we actually do quite well at most of the grossest features, right? Which is somewhat of a surprise. Okay, so here's some, uh, some last millennium simulations, two different models, um, and you've got some, uh, this is the pages, one of the initial, initial uh, pages 2K uh, estimates, and, you know, there's, there's some discrepancies, you know, particularly here, that's interesting, what's going on there? Um, and, ooh, look, the same thing happens there, what's going on here? Well, it turns out that that is a massive volcano that in the forcings data set that was given to these people was way too large massively large, uh, and, for, uh, and for reasons that are somewhat institutional, somewhat scientific, um, it means that all of these models have a massive uh, uh, cooling at this point that just does not exist in the data. Um, it turns out that the different forcings that you give uh, the models actually makes a big difference to things like decadal variability and, and centennial variability. So uh, this is, these are two runs where we only did the solar forcing, but two different solar forcings. And you say, well, they're vaguely kind of connected, but there's a few places where things are going on. Um, uh, you put in uh, the volcanic, you, it, it becomes very difficult to see the difference in the solar. So, so solar not really having that much of an effect in these runs. Um, and then you just look at the difference that the volcanic um, estimates have. And it turns out that the different volcanic estimates have a massive impact on the climate and on the climate change and on the decadal variability. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, that was perhaps uh, a little unexpected. Uh, when you look at uh, you know, things like the difference between the, the medieval climate anomaly and the last, uh, the little ice age, uh, so here's, a, here's an estimate of uh, what that is from the data. You could, you could quibble about that. Some of this is not as robust as it could be. Uh, but then here's like you know, three different, on, uh, five different ensembles which have different forcings. And okay, so there's some coherence, right? They all have a kind of polar amplification. Uh, but some of them don't show very much of an effect at all. Some of them show a quite large effect. But there's no kind of regional coherence between them, right? Which means that it's, it's very hard to know whether the regional inconsistency between the model means and the actuality is due to the forcings that we put in or whether it's due to the, uh, the model physics. So uh, quickly summarize. Um, so the mid Holocene data, all the models show the expected northern hemisphere summer warming, um, but it's much more uniform than it is in the data. Is that a problem in the data or a problem in the models? Hard to tell. Um, but the changes in seasonality are, 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 are noticeably too small, um, and in southern Africa, it's like it, there's no coherence at all. Um, the LGM, of course, the LGM cools. That's fine. Uh, there's too much cooling in the tropical Pacific uh, compared to data, but. Uh, you know, the, the North Atlantic um, does something weird in the data, it doesn't do it in the models. 
Uh, and again, each one of these is like, is there a problem in the model? Is there a problem in the proxy? Is there a problem in the forcing? Unclear. Uh, the last millennium, uh, the long-term trends are small, um, but you know you get things that are that are reasonable compared to the best uh, data assimilation that you that, that you can do. Uh, you see this massive response to volcanoes, and so it turns out that you need to get the volcanoes right um, in ways that we did not get them right, which is unfortunate. Um, and so you get a lot of variability that uh, that comes about just from the changes that you have in the forcings, which is unfortunate. So, uh, so the, the, you know, that was the first time that we'd done that experiment. So the second time that we're doing this experiment, um, we're going to be doing it a slightly better uh, way, hopefully. Um, uh, and I mentioned solar earlier on. Uh, so solar forcing is, is one of those things where, you know, we've looked at it since the beginning of climate modeling, but we keep looking at it in slightly better and more sophisticated ways, um, and so that we end up using, you know, more and more different mechanisms by which it might affect the climate. Um, and so, uh, so just, to, uh, just to, to give you a couple of other, other things. So the, the biggest change, of course, with the solar, uh, with the sun, is that you know, when, the solar, when the sun is active, um, you get more irradiance, right? So, so you get an increase in the amount of energy coming into the system. Okay, so people have been modeling that for a long time. Um, uh, it turns out that over a solar cycle, and, and even over the longer term cycles of the sun, uh, the UV component of the, the, solar, the solar activity increases by much larger than the, the total mean. So you have, uh, you have a mechanism by which uh, changes in the UV, which affects temperature in the stratosphere and affects uh, ozone, uh, can amplify the signal that, uh, that you're looking at. And of course, if you allow the ozone to change, if your model is capable of having interactive chemistry, then that increases the signal as well, because now the ozone is changing, and that changes the temperature and all the rest of it. Um, there are other things that are potentially uh, happening. So people have speculated about uh, galactic cosmic rays being modulated by the solar activity, which could be seeding clouds and then changing the climate. Um, uh, I won't talk about it now, but the answer is this is zero. Um, uh, people have talked about you know, solar uh, energetic particles, which come in and change the chemistry in the stratosphere. Uh, this is a real thing, but it's only, it's only really important in the stratosphere. Now, the fact is that all of these things changing in the stratosphere affect things that we care about on the ground because there's a connection through uh, the, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation to, to winter climate. Uh, there's, there's connections via the QBO to, to different things that we're seeing. There are connections in the polar regions and polar, uh, polar variability, some stratospheric warmings, um, and you know, potential uh, changes in, the, uh, in ENSO or the Hadley set circulation. Um, these are slightly more speculative uh, than, than the others. Um, but the runs that we did for the last millennium didn't include many of those things. Um, okay, but for instance, so here's, here's an example. Um, the runs that we did for the, for the last millennium, uh, they used this model, which is non-interactive, so no interactive chemistry, uh, but with the same forcing. And this is a model that we ran with uh, traces of chemistry, aerosols, direct effects. Uh, maybe that kind of stands for dust and indirect effects. And, uh, and what you can see is that there's actually a, an enhancement of the signal when you start adding in more variability and more processes and more mechanisms uh, that allow, uh, in this case, the solar forcing to, uh, to impact the climate. So, uh, so in, these, in these models, uh, the, the response in the global mean uh, to, uh, to the solar forcing doubles. Um, so here's, uh, here's, here's some solar cycle uh, analyses. Uh, so you know here's the so zero is the is the peak of the of the solar cycle, and so there's a maximum uh, change in the global mean uh, like about a year afterwards, um, and then you know you get a you know you, the, the cycle is is symmetric in here, so you get a, a cooling you know six or seven years afterwards, um, and the difference between the solid lines are the interactive ones, and the, and the dotted lines are the non-interactive ones. Uh, so for instance, in the red line here, you can see it's barely significant. Uh, but then when you add in the interaction, you know, it becomes A, strongly significant, about twice as large. Uh, but in this other model here, the blue model, which only differs because of an ocean component, um, it turns out that, uh, that they're not actually distinguishable, and you get something very similar, uh, which is odd. Um, and the, but this, the, and the uh, but you get this very different response uh, in the uh, 
in the, in the cool period too. And it turns out to be related to how they interact with the, with the sea ice in the southern hemisphere, which in both of these models was total crap. So it's very hard to know exactly what's going on there. The point being that the models can improve and then the responses that the models have to the same forcing uh, can actually be quite different uh, depending on what you include in those models. And so you have to be a little bit careful about making sure you include all the right and relevant things. Okay. So this is the second thing that I suggested that one should do with pair clown models. What we're looking for are metrics that show similar behavior in the past and in the future. And if we can constrain that behavior in the past, we might then be able to project that change in the behavior in the future in ways that perhaps don't depend on the details of any particular individual model. What you're looking for is credibility in a relationship that you see in the past as opposed to any absolute uh, value. So uh, for instance, uh, this, uh, this is a, a graph that uh, Camille Risi uh, put together. And what it shows is that the, uh, the change in the uh, surface, sea surface temperature in, uh, this is the northern hemisphere minus the southern hemisphere, so it's the inter-hemispheric inter temperature gradient, um, will cause a shift in, in the ITCZ latitude um, in, in a relatively predictable manner across a whole different set of models across a whole different set of time periods, right? So not just one time period. So here's, a, here's an example of, of what I'm looking at. Um, if you, uh, you might be aware that, uh, uh, that future predictions predict that the land is gonna warm uh, more and faster than the ocean, right? And you think, oh, well, it's kind of a, uh, you know, thermal capacity thing, but it's actually, it's actually more than that. So even at equilibrium, the warming over land under two times CO2 is larger than the warming over the ocean. And it turns out that that's a very, very robust result, even if you go back to uh, very uh, cold periods, right? So uh, here are uh, uh, four different sets of runs, right? So the red ones here are increasing CO2, uh, either slowly or abruptly. Uh, the green ones uh, and the mid Holocene are, you know, close to present and uh, historical mid Holocene. And then you've got the LGM, which are the cold ones down here, right? So it turns out that if you put a line through all these data, um, it's actually uh, it's actually pretty coherent, right? So this is something that is a robust uh, relationship that you see across many models. So this is six different models. Um, the same, you see something very similar with um, latitudinal amplification, so polar amplification. How much warmer is it in the poles than it is in the, uh, in the tropics? And again, that's something that turns out to be quite robust. And so now you can say, okay, well, let's put in some observational constraints. Do we have information about the land-ocean contrast, um, perhaps not globally, but, but regionally? Right? So uh, this is the, uh, the land-ocean contrast, and now we're just uh, looking not at all the data, but just the data where there are uh, observational constraints, right? So the observational constraints are the, uh, are the dark blue crosses in here. And, uh, and then this is the same, these are the same models. So this is, uh, you know, the, the modern models. These are the, uh, uh, so, so we've got a, the real data in there and in there. And you can see that as an ensemble, the models capture this particular relationship. Um, and the same is true for the polar amplification, right? So where we have data, the model pattern that we've just shown is robust across the future and the past is actually supported by the observations where we actually have observations. And that allows us to say something credible about what's gonna happen in the future. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so for instance, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is basically the same thing, but for a different region. This is the North Atlantic and Europe compared to the tropics. Uh, so here's the temperature difference over land. Uh, on this side, here's the temperature difference over the oceans. And you can see, again, there's a very nice uh, relationship. And then there's the observational constraint that's coming in from the LGM. Now, you notice that the models are not directly on that point because they show different levels of cooling or warming uh, depending on what forcings they use, but the basic overall pattern is very, uh, is very clear. 
Uh, this is in the tropics and this is in the North Atlantic again. So here in the North Atlantic, all the models are too warm uh, and in the tropics, all the models are too cold, uh, but still that, that relationship is still robust. Now, if you're gonna use paleoclimate to distinguish between models uh, skill or to say which model is, is the right model to use, even though that's a, an odd question to be asking at this point. What you want is not this. If the future changes that, you, that you're predicting actually have no correlation or relationship to the skill of a model uh, in the past, uh, then you, you, learn, you learn nothing. Right? So that's not what you want. What you want instead is to find features where the future change is correlated to the skill in the past. Now, it doesn't have to be linear. It just has to, there just has to be a relationship that makes some sense. So if you have, if you have that, that's, that's no good at all. Now, the problem with a lot of the work that's been done where people kind of like somewhat ad hocly decide that this model, I don't like this model, it doesn't have a good enough ENSO. I don't know this model, it doesn't have a good enough one soon or something like that. I'm just going to throw it out. I'm just going to look at these other models. Um, is that they're basically assuming this kind of relationship. They're basically assuming that the skill is tied to the future prediction. And therefore, by looking for the skill, they'll be able to get a better, uh, they'll be able to get a better estimate of what the future is. Unfortunately, people don't test this, right? I mean, not everybody, obviously, but people assume this without testing it. And it needs to be demonstrated that the way that you're winnowing the models or the way that you're weighting the models actually has some correlation or relationship to the thing that you want to predict. And, uh, and, and people, uh, generally speaking, have not done enough of that, but, but people are getting better. Uh, so, for instance, here's, here's an example that, uh, that we worked on. Um, here's the modern sea, uh, seasonality in Arctic sea ice across the ensemble. Okay? Um, the, the data is in there somewhere. Is the data in there somewhere? No. The actual observations are not in there somewhere, but they're kind of in the middle. But there's a big spread in how much sea ice the different models show. If you look at how much change there is in the sea ice, uh, say by around 2050, so you haven't lost all of the summer sea ice, but it's on its way, um, you know, you get, you get a, a, a big mess, right? So, you know, this, uh, these changes here, you know, this is millions of square kilometers. Um, and so this is a big difference between here where you still got quite a lot of summer sea ice to here where you have none. Okay, so there's a big change. And you say, well, can you, make, can, you make a better, can you make a better estimate of that? So one of the places that you might look for that would be in the mid-Holocene. So we know in the mid-Holocene that uh, Arctic summer sea ice was less than today. Right, we have, uh, we have mid-Holocene dated beaches in Greenland that are today still totally encased in ice. Right? So we know that there were um, uh, warmer periods within the Holocene, uh, perhaps in the early Holocene as well, where we had less sea ice than today. Can we use that connection to say something about the skill in these models here? Uh, so we can look at these same models, and we can look at those same models and how they responded to the mid-Holocene change, which is driven mainly by orbital forcing, right? So rather than greenhouse gases. And you can see that the picture is slightly different, right? But uh, is there a correlation between the sensitivity of the models in the mid-Holocene compared to the sensitivity of the models in the future? And the answer is uh, no, not really. <laughs> Uh, so this is rather unfortunate because we thought, oh no, we're, good. we're onto something here. We can we can do this. Um, uh, and it turns out that like these two, I mean, if you join, if you did a linear regression through this, uh, you get something that's significant. But it's obviously something that's tied quite strongly to uh, to these three down here, and and the spread here is 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 very large. So um, we're still working on that. There may be something there, uh, but it's it's not quite as easy as we thought it was going to be. Um, we, can, we can try using the LGM, for instance, just to constrain uh, climate sensitivity. So this is, a, uh, uh, this is, this is work basically by uh, James Allen and, and Julie Hargraves. Uh, so here, like the dots here, are the blue dots are uh, individual models, and the red dots are a kind of Monte Carlo simulation of what they uh, should look like. And there is a correlation between how cold it gets in the, in the tropics and the climate sensitivity of the models. Right? It's not a great correlation, but it exists. And then you can say, okay, well, given that we know something about how it cooled in the tropics, even if the models didn't do the right thing, but we do know that the model, that what, what the cooling is, assume, assuming that the, 
that the data set is, is correct, uh, can, you, uh, can you then constrain the climate sensitivity based on what we've observed for the cooling? And the answer is yes, you can, actually. Um, but it doesn't constrain it very much. So uh, the green is the prior distribution that you get just by averaging the models. So this is just a histogram, basically, of the models. Um, and then if you use the, uh, the data uh, from Margo, particularly, uh, to constrain that, so you, you upweight the models that match Margo uh, better, uh, then you shift the uh, the distribution a little bit to towards the cool side, so you lose you know some of the weights kind of above five degrees, right? So you end up with uh, with a mean sensitivity that's a little bit uh, lower and a median which is about uh, which is about three degrees. Well, you kind of knew that already, so it wasn't a big uh, a big shift, but it, it demonstrates the kind of things that you might want to be able to do. Now, some of the metrics that you might look at are totally dependent on the forcings that you put in. Right, so they're not really a test of the model at all. So for instance, if you look at um, decadal and centennial variability in these runs, you get a huge spread, right? So here's the period. So, okay, so here's like decadal to centennial. So that's kind of this period in here, right? And these are different models, uh, but what they, well, it's the same model, but actually all they differ in is the forcing. So how much volcanoes do I put in like radically changes my decadal to centennial variability. And if you look at the, uh, the observed uh, estimates of these, so these are from, like, so this is Lundquist, Mann, uh, Moberg. Uh, these are reconstructions of, of paleoclimate. Uh, they have some weird, uh, uh, weird things uh, at, the, at the lower frequencies because of the way they're constructed. But even if you take what they're, what they're purporting to do, there's a massive difference between the uh, the Lundquist uh, decadal variability and the Mann and Moberg decadal variability. And so, you know, are the models consistent with this? Are they not consistent with that? It, you know, it's very hard to tell at this point. So, let me conclude. Um, the multimodal ensembles that we put together for CMIP 5 and, and what we will put together for CMIP 6 do a reasonable job of kind of zeroth order uh, simulations of past climate, and uh, particularly the, uh, the, the periods that we selected. Though there are still systematic differences. Uh, you know, so you can go to any of these and you can look at the model ensemble means and you can say, oh, well, all the models do this wrong, all the models do this wrong. So there's still work to be done. The key thing to remember is that these paleoclimate tests are out of sample. None of the modeling groups tried to get a better simulation of the last glacial maximum as part of their model development. Right? So this is new data and in a kind of classic philosophy of science way, you know, it's data that has not been accommodated to, right? So if you get a good estimate of what's going on there, uh, that has more credibility than data that you embedded within your system right from the beginning. There are climate features, the land ocean contrast, polar amplification, uh, et cetera, maybe some more, uh, that are robust across past and future that if you go to a cool climate, you go to a warm climate, they change in very similar ways, right? That is useful because that tells us that it doesn't really matter exactly how things are gonna develop, but these are the kind of features that we expect and that these things are robust. So we do get some constraints on future projections from these paleoclimate experiments. But this is really, we, we like, you know, the, the, the paper that I've been signing, the Schmier et al. 2014, uh, really it was, it was just a, uh, you know, like a, a skim across the top of what could be done. Putting paleo into the CMIP5 process was a hugely positive step, not just for people that care about paleo climate, but it was hugely positive because it brought in these out-of-sample tests into the mainstream. People that do not care at all about paleoclimate are suddenly running paleo runs with their models in order to just kind of get along with the community. And that was very, very useful. Um, there's a number, a number of periods that we're gonna be doing more of uh, that, that tell us a little bit more uh, in detail about other things like the Pliocene, right, the last time that CO2 was in fact uh, greater than 400 uh, parts per million as, as, as far as we can tell, the last interglacial when we had you know, massive changes in Greenland uh, with only relatively modest changes in the orbital forcing and almost no changes in greenhouse gases. Uh, things like the 8.2 Kilia event, where you've got a massive, not quite, no, no massive, it's 50 centimeters of global sea level rise, that's massive, right? 
right? That's, that, that'd be a deal, right? Okay, so um, massive change in, uh, in, in sea level um, and you know, interesting things that are going on in the North Atlantic uh, because of all that extra fresh water. Uh, so we can do more of that. But a lot of the things that we really need to be doing, we can't yet do. And the reason why we can't yet do it is because our ability to analyze our three petabytes and growing very, very fast data set is that nobody can download three petabytes onto their hard drive and do the analysis they want to do. Right? If you want to do something that's process-based, where you're scanning through all of, the, all of the model runs and you're trying to pick out you know, an event like a big El Nino or a mega drought or a, uh, a, a big deep convection or a hurricane or anything that you actually uh, might think of and you want to do it in an efficient way and then you want to see what the multivariate response is to any of those particular processes, it's almost impossible right? because you would have to download far too much data uh, to be able to do that. Our institutional uh, setup is to provide data archives where you can download as much data as you want. But it turns out that what you want is not possible. What we need to be doing is pushing the institutions that be, include, including NASA, including NSF, to actually build data analysis on top of the data that we're, that we're archiving. So we don't want data archives, we want, we want data platforms where you can go in and have it slice through the data any which way without anybody having to download data and using you know, some massively parallel uh, system that they have set up there. People have talked about this for a long time, it just does not exist. And that really holds us back from being able to take the full, uh, the full, the full measure of the information that's within these archives that have already been done uh, and, and applying it to, uh, to, to our future predicament. So, leave you with a few thoughts. Prediction is indeed difficult, um, particularly of the future. Apparently, Niels Bohr is not the only person to have said that, but, you know, he's a good person that did say it. Um, and, of course, uh, to quote from The Day After Tomorrow, which is, the, to date, the only movie that has starred a paleoclimatologist uh, in a leading role. Um, I, there's, there's a, I've, got, I've got a clip here. I can show you if you want it. But uh, it, 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 it's just great. There's a big... There's a big do you remember? Who, who saw this movie? Everybody see this movie? Oh, yeah, well, pretty, so you remember, there's a big, there's a big control room, like the, the Climate Model Center control room. And so he says, oh, you know, the, what, do our, what do our models say us? And the guy says, oh, our grid models are not going to save us now. And, everyone says, and then somebody comes in, well, I can couple my paleo model with your hurricane model, and I'll have it ready by tomorrow. And I'm going, ha, ah. <laughs> we, 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 we went, like, the first day that I came out, you know, like 20 people from the lab all went, and we were all seeing in a row. And, uh, and he comes out, and he says that, and, uh, and we're just like rolling around in the aisles and like everybody else is like silence. You know, going like, who are these people? Why are they laughing? Why is that funny? <laughs> but we all laughed at the Dick Cheney jokes, so. Anyway, cool. Um, this is me. Uh, I wrote a book if you care about my views on climate change. It's pretty. It does well with uh, uncles and aunts and uh, Republicans. Um, and if you, uh, if you care about any of the other things I talk about, um, I tweet quite a lot, um, Climate of Gavin. Um, and uh, my blog, which has been going, when did we start? We started in 2004. So 14 years I have been blogging about climate science um, and some of the interesting things that occur, um, both as a function of the blog and outside of the blog, um, are occasionally worth looking at if you care. Anyway, thank you very much. Tony. Yes. What do you see as the big obstacles for getting those to where we would really like them to be? Do you want me to name names? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of it is sociological, right? We 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 don't value these as much as we value other things, and therefore people don't prioritize them to the extent that they should. Uh, part of it is institutional. Uh, rewards for 
uh, working on data synthesis are smaller than rewards on for for working on you know new proxies and higher resolution cores and and those kinds of things. Um, partly, it's you know, people don't know how to do it properly, and so there's a lot of ad hoc efforts that are never really supported well enough to be sustainable. So that's also institutional. Uh, you know, can we change that? I think we we can change all of those things. Um, uh, partly, it's uh, you know, you know, p people people do something. And they do it to their to their best, and they and they you know wrestle all of this detailed stuff, and they and they try and explain all the detailed stuff, and then somebody comes along and says, well, can you just smush that all together so I can get just like an average thing? And and people react against that because they spent so much time doing something that was much better than just the smushed average, and so it doesn't get done because people don't want to smush their beautiful high resolution work into something uh, that would be useful to anybody else, and so somebody from outside comes along and does it, and they do a totally rubbish job, and you say, oh, all these people doing synthesis, they don't know what they're talking about. And the answer is yes, because they're trying to do what should have been done by people that actually knew what they were talking about. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I've got a paper coming out uh, in a couple of weeks' time where for, for the purposes of, of a rather odd argument that I'm making, which I won't go into, uh, I wanted to have a, uh, a synthesis of what happened during one of the ocean anoxic events in the Cretaceous. Right? And... Um, there's been lots of papers written about this, like dozens of papers written about this event, and I thought, well, I'll pick this one because it's obviously well characterized in the data, and I'll be able to just, and I'll just be able to plot it, and I don't have to worry about uh, getting anything wrong or anything. There's a paper with brilliant figures and things, and I thought, oh, I emailed them, where is your data? Silence. There's a paper here that has an age model. Oh, I thought, well, there we are, there's an age model. Turns out to be totally incoherent with the edge model on this paper over here. The papers that had the uh, temperatures are on a totally different depth model and, and stratigraphy as the people that had the, the Delta C13. And in the end, what I end up doing is I talk to like two or three people and they say, well, um, you know, there's no real way, a good way of doing it, so just make up your own thing. And so I end up making my own uh, smush of what happened over this event where I'm, me personally, I'm cross correlating uh, faunal zones of animals. I've never heard of before, and I don't even know really are the same thing in one paper from another. It's insane that I am doing that. Now, I don't think I did a terrible job, but I have no idea. <laughs> right? That's the kind of thing that should be done by the people who know what they're talking about. It should not be done by me. Why am I the author of a paper on 4AM isotope modeling to the, to the deep sea floor? I know nothing about 4AMs. I've never picked a 4AM in my life. I wouldn't know a 4AM if it hit me on the nose. And yet, I wrote a paper on that. I wrote a paper uh, on data synthesis of water isotope measurements, right? Because when I went around, and I said, hey, I've got this model that, uh, that has water isotope simulations in it. I'd like, you know, what's, the, what's your gridded data set that I could compare it to? And everybody said, oh, well, that would be a good idea. It's insane. This is not a good use of my time. This is not a good use of your time. Right? These things should emerge from the fields that know what they're talking about and not done by people who just parachute from in from outside who have actually no interest in the, in the details but just want the answer. There's a really fundamental problem that we have. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I mean, I've talked about this, you know, to people and to program managers and to funders, you know, pretty much I'm blue in the face. And yeah, you know, people think that the federal government moves slowly. I'll tell you, nothing moves slower than the scientific community. Does that answer your question? All right, because I can name names too. <laughs> Wrong question. The question is, uh, who does enough different things with clouds that we hope that the real clouds somewhere fall in between? What do you do with clouds? We do okay. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that uh, for, some, uh, for some metrics, you know, if you look at, for instance, the uh, optical depth versus pressure diagrams, you know, we're pretty good except for a couple of uh, 
things associated with low clouds in the, uh, in the stratus regions, right, which nobody is getting right right now. But you know, our next model will do a much better job. Um, we, we, we have to get past the idea that one model is just going to be the right model. Right? That, that, I don't think anybody really believes that anymore. The, the structural uncertainties in how you build models, what you do, the approximations that you make in all the different elements uh, mean that we're, uh, we're not going to get to the point where we can just say that one model is, is the model that we want to do. And this is the right model for clouds. So if you care about clouds, if you care about um, you know, clouds and sea surface, you have to be looking at across a range because the, uh, you know, one model might have a really good simulation of uh, you know, the convective anvils and another one might have a really good simulation of the low stratus, but the, the things that control these things are different, and so there's no guarantee that both models are going to have, you know, the one model is going to have both of those things. So uh, I can show you a slide from our latest work, um, and 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 it's again it's it's like this kind of progression to synthesis. So you take all the different arm sites, you take all the different um, uh, kind of single column, you know, massively uh, instrumented uh, examples, and we have you know we have things for off the coast of Africa, we have things in the Great Plains, we have things in the Arctic. We have, you know you put them all together, and you uh, and you try and create a, uh, a single global parameterization or set of parameterizations that fit all of those independently, right? Without, you know, so you can, it's easy to tune to one case, right? But if you try and tune to all of them at the same time, it's almost impossible. So you basically, you have to rely on your understanding of the physics to get something that works. Um, we've been able to do that. So, so the next version of our model, which, is, which will be gear C3, um, our, uh, our ability to match like the, the, all of those data across a whole suite of, uh, of different climate types uh, is better than it's ever been, and by quite a lot. Right? So uh, that data, synthesizing that data, making sure that you can do all of those experiments, building a single column model within the GCM so that everything is exactly the same as in the GCM, all of those things have taken time, uh, more time than they should have taken, but anyway, but, but we can use them. And we, and we can uh, use them to demonstrate uh, that the models are better than they used to be. So it's not wasted money. It's not wasted money. No. No. So but if I were to play a devil's advocate, because this question was asked to me several years ago uh, by Nobel laureate physicists, if I were to give you a billion dollars, what can you do? Mm. <laughs> I give it to that guy over there. Yeah, no. no, a billion dollars. Well, um, the first thing I would do is I would build uh, uh, supercomputers on top of data archives, because the amount of uh, data that we're bringing in, not just from the, the, the climate models, but from the reanalyses, from the uh, satellite data, uh, and our ability to, to search through that for interesting processes that would be the equivalent of all those different arm sites. Um, is is pitiful, and so my first chunk of change would be on that. Here. Yeah. Yeah, Again, going back to what you said about the data, is 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 the biologist a good example like the data banks that they have, and should we not just think about where we are, but but about how we educate our own students to use it? Right, so, so the state of genomics uh, databases, which I'm not sure, what, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. so that, that's, actually, that's actually pretty good. Um, so pretty much everybody is putting in their data as soon as it arrives. Uh, people are finding mistakes, people are fixing mistakes, uh, people are being able to mine it very intelligently. Uh, so yes, uh, that, that seems to be a good path forward. Um, part of that 
effort there is that there are very strong and large monetary rewards for people who can mine it most efficiently. And that seems to concentrate the mind. Um, to the extent that we don't quite have the same incentives in climate, uh, it might not happen the same way. But yes, I mean, there are, you know, th these are things that are happening in other fields um, as, as well. Uh, I would. I don't know. I'm, I'm not privy to that. All right. Um, cool. Uh, we'll be around. Ask individual questions. But thank you. Thank you.